It takes a lot of power to run a space program. And in some places where NASA will go in the future, they don't have access to anything like this. So agency scientists and engineers are looking to do some huge things on a very small scale. NASA goes nuclear, next on Real World. NASA's mission to explore worlds beyond our own would never get off the ground without innovative ways to power all the operations that make that possible. To explore the universe, yeah, you need a lot of energy. Mike Houts is a nuclear research manager at Marshall Space Flight Center. But one of the areas that NASA is looking at right now is fission. And so this is actually using the nuclear fission process to generate energy that can be used for any of our exploration needs. Atoms are the most basic units of matter. The nucleus of an atom contains positively charged particles called protons. The number of protons in an atom determines the atomic number of an element. Elements are arranged on the periodic table according to their atomic number. Atoms of the same element have the same number of protons and electrons, but might have different number of neutrons. Atoms with different numbers of neutrons are called isotopes. Some elements have isotopes that are unstable. That is, they do not hold together well. When they break apart, they undergo a nuclear reaction and become radioactive. Two new elements are produced. The atomic number of these two elements adds up to the atomic number of the original element. Here's an example. Start with an atom of uranium. Its atomic number is 92. When this atom splits through nuclear fission, you get two new elements. One might be, say, barium, with an atomic number of 56. So what would the other one be? Do the math. Subtract the atomic number of barium, 56, from the atomic number of uranium, 92. You're left with 36. And that is the atomic number of krypton, the other element. When uranium splits, many elements can result, but the atomic number of the new elements will always be between 32 and 60, and the sum of their atomic numbers will always be 92, the atomic number of uranium. Okay, back to Mike House. He and his team are working to develop a viable energy source that would satisfy many needs of space exploration. The application is everything from the life support systems to uh, in situ resource utilization, some communication, really just all of the outpost activities is what they're looking at using the electricity for. The system is based on old technology, the Stirling engine, which was originally developed in the 19th century. The engine converts heat into electricity. So, nuclear fission would create the heat that the Stirling engine would turn into usable electricity to power operations. This system is designed for about 40 kilowatts of power. That would power about eight houses here on Earth. That's a little more than a solar array on the space station, which can produce 32 kilowatts. Plus, with a nuclear power plant, you don't need sunlight. It's a very high power by NASA standards. It really gives us the opportunity to have a power-rich environment. It can also be operated anywhere on the surface of the moon, anywhere on the surface of Mars. So it gives us a lot of flexibility, a lot of power capability. But as reactors go, it's actually very, very tiny. Compared to a terrestrial reactor, it's about 1 20,000th the power level. And the safety concerns associated with nuclear power are virtually non-existent with this system. They have what's called a negative temperature reactivity feedback coefficient. What that basically means is if the reactor starts to warm up, uh, the system itself actually gets less reactive and that'll tend to cool the system down. The system starts to cool down too much, the system will actually shrink and become slightly more reactive, that'll cause it to heat back up. So the, the systems themselves are very stable. And any fears about the nuclear material creating a disaster in the event of a launch mishap would be erased thanks to good engineering. The nice point about reactors is they operate basically by uh, having the right materials get in the right geometry and that will cause the reactor to turn on. And so what's been done in the system is to basically make sure it only turns on when you want it to turn on. And the system is designed such that uh, you know, during launch, any uh, credible launch accident, that it will not inadvertently turn on. So, very safe and incredibly efficient. The amount of fuel we have on board, we burn about 1% of our fuel every 12 years. And so we're not gonna run out of fuel. Uh, however, there'll be other parts of the system that might limit the lifetime. The prototype system doesn't use nuclear fission. That's for a future iteration of the concept. For now, it uses resistance heaters that closely mimic the heat from fission. 
The Stirling engine turns that heat into electricity. Here's how it works. What that simulator does is it heats the coolant. In this case, we're using a coolant as a mixture of sodium and potassium. Heats that coolant to about 850 Kelvin, and then that hot coolant is used to provide power to a Stirling power conversion subsystem. And what that does is it takes a portion of the uh, energy that's in the NAC coolant and converts it into electricity. About 25% of that energy is converted from heat into electricity. Now in the process of that energy being transferred uh, to the uh, Stirling engine, it, it actually cools the NAC down, and so that slightly cooler NAC uh, then goes through the circuit, it's uh, repressurized in a pump, and goes back through the core simulator where it's uh, heated back up, and then uh, uh, continues in the circuit. NASA scientists, working with the Department of Energy, think that they could have a nuclear fission-based version of this system in place within five to six years. Keep track of this project in all of NASA's missions at www.nasa.gov.